Welcome to the uh, la last of our six panels on COVID and the law. Uh, I'm Eugene Meyer, president of the Federal Society. And uh, I would say for those of you who are interested but did not get a chance to catch some of our other panels, they will all be on our website, fedsoc.org, as will more detailed biographies. The, the moderator will introduce briefly the more detailed biographies of all the speakers. Uh, to moderate our uh, panel on civil liberties and, the, and the COVID-19, we are to have Chris DeMuth, who currently is a fellow at the Hudson Institute and a longtime president of AEI, and even longer time focus on these and many other sorts of key public policy issues and one of our leading intellectuals. Uh, Chris? Thank you, Gene. Welcome one and all. This session will examine the civil liberties issues that have been raised by government actions to contend with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. We will hear from four eminent legal scholars in this order. Nadine Strassen of New York Law School, who is former longtime chairman of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Eugene Volokh of the UCLA Law School, who is host of the eponymous website, The Volokh Conspiracy. Julia Mahoney of the University of Virginia School of Law, who specializes in property, public finance, and constitutional law. And finally, Mila Versteeg of University of Virginia School of Law, who specializes in comparative constitutional law and international law. Further information about each of them is available at the conference website. <clears throat> Our session will run for up to 90 minutes concluding not later than the 5.15 Eastern time in the United States. We will have individual presentations and then a general panel discussion and then questions from attendees. When question time arrives, I will ask those with questions to click raise hand on your Zoom screen or star nine on your phone. First, uh, to, step, to set the stage briefly, the centerpiece of the U.S. response to the pandemic has been a mass suppression of everyday civil liberties going beyond anything in American history. As much can be said of most of the other free democracies, beginning in March, 43 states and the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico issued lockdown orders that required the vast majority of Americans to isolate at home and uh, to uh, limit their outings to a few specified purposes. Public and private gatherings were limited to small numbers and virtually all schools, churches, and businesses were shuttered. The restrictions were to be temporary, of course, but their duration was extended from weeks to months and are just beginning to be relaxed. The closure of schools and large indoor gatherings may extend through the fall. The orders were ex exertions of state police power undertaken by governors, mayors, agencies, sometimes with explicit authority step set forth in state legislation, sometimes without it. We have learned a great deal about the virus and its patterns of transmission since March, and there are serious debates whether the lockdowns were sensible and effective compared to more targeted measures outside of hot spots such as New York City and San Francisco. But the orders were met with widespread public acceptance and very high levels of compliance. Indeed, even before the orders were issued, some individuals and resi residential communities uh, had begun to shelter, some shops and businesses had begun to close down, and most and many large assemblies had been canceled. What I've described as a suppression of civil liberties uh, could uh, just as well be uh, described as voluntary, at least had important elements, of uh, voluntary temporary surrender of liberties and of popular mobilization against a mysterious but clearly deadly contagion. Civil liberties issues, however, <clears throat> are largely counter-majoritarian. Uh, they do not depend upon popular assent at the moment they are exercised and they are often most dear when they run afoul of official government policies. The initial lockdown orders distinguished broadly among different sorts of activities, and some of the distinctions had no evident relationship either to collective defense against the spread of COVID-19 or individual self-protection against contracting the disease. Some of these were probably mistakes 
just made in haste, such as banning outdoor gardening services, but others seemed more deliberate, such as categorizing pot shops as essential, but church services as inessential. Now the lockdowns are being replaced by opening up policies that involve uh, narrower and many more numerous kinds of distinctions. Regulation of public conduct, such as distancing and masking, are now being applied to much larger numbers of citizens, and many new policies are being introduced for mandatory testing, contact tracing, public surveillance, restrictions on interstate travel, and public opinion has splintered. Many of us are still reluctant to be out and about, but many others are busting out, setting up shop, and releasing months of pent-up energy. The famous American spirit of feisty individualism and permissionless freedom is reawakening. Our panelists will analyze civil liberties issues that have, been, that have arisen in the course of this drama, some of them perhaps touching on federal as well as state policies. These will include issues under the Bill of Rights and the broader question whether civil liberties are best protected in circumstances such as these by specific rights or by government structure. We will also examine how these controversies have played out under the constitutional regimes of other nations and consider whether they are transitory incidents of an extreme emergency or may have lasting consequences for law and policy. We will begin with uh, Professor Nadine Strassen. Nadine, the Zoom, pod the Zoom podium is yours. Thank you so much, Chris, for that really terrific introduction to a huge topic. And I'm so uh, happy and honored to share um, with my distinguished co-panelists. So I thought in my limited time, the best use for it would be, uh, number one, to set out general principles that are applicable to assessing all government restrictions on civil liberties or human rights in the interest of protecting public health. And time permitting, I'd like to discuss one or more specific sets of issues in terms of how we apply those standards, including uh, the right to life and health itself for those who are in government custody, uh, the right to vote, and the right to privacy. So first, with respect to general principles, broad consensus about these across the ideological spectrum Indeed, I think the very first statement I heard about these from a United States government official fairly early on was Attorney General Bill Barr, who said these words that were music to my ears as a civil libertarian. He said, quote, there is no pandemic exception to the Constitution and its Bill of Rights. Now, that said, he did go on correctly to point out that when we have a genuine emergency, uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, may have uh, be consistent with restrictions that are necessary and temporary in order to deal with the genuine emergency. And it's interesting, the United States Constitution is distinct from constitutions in other countries and international human rights uh, treaties insofar as we do not have expressly written into the Constitution a general exception for emergencies. I think it is noteworthy that the Constitution itself explicitly provides for only one exception to only one right in specific types of emergencies, and that is the suspension clause regarding the writ of habeas corpus. Be that as it may, uh, I don't think even the most ardent civil libertarian would disagree uh, that most rights can be subject to restriction, subject to the so-called strict scrutiny uh, standard. Uh, and notably, this, although this is a standard in American law, it is mirrored in international human rights law and the law of other countries and regional human rights treaties as well. Uh, namely, is the measure necessary? Is it narrowly tailored? Is the least restrictive alternative, least restrictive of civil liberties in order to promote the unarguably compelling goal of promoting public health. Uh, and in addition to that substantive standard, there also have to be procedural safeguards, including due process, accountability, and transparency. Here, let me pause to say that 
Uh, with respect to that necessity, less restrictive alternative uh, criterion, a government restriction on civil liberties cannot satisfy that standard if it is not even effective in countering the public health danger. And sadly, uh, but not surprisingly, because all of this is so new and in flux, a number of liberty restricting measures don't even meet the effectiveness standard, let alone the least restrictive alternative. Um, this, of course, is a requires a very fact specific assessment of each challenge restriction. And with apologies in advance, it's impossible for me to keep abreast of even all of the restrictions, let alone all of the developing factual nuances, uh, which is why I wanted to concentrate on the general standards. Uh, I think, you know, especially when something is so fact specific, a very important legal issue is who bears the burden of proof and with what level of deference. Under strict scrutiny, the government should bear the burden of, pr of proof. That's true under international human rights laws as, as well. And yet, uh, in a recent statement in a Supreme Court ruling, Chief Justice John Roberts stressed his perspective. It was a five to four ruling. He stressed that courts should be highly deferential to government officials in assessing the constitutionality of pandemic-induced restrictions. Uh, he specifically, he happened to be talking about uh, upholding restrictions on worship services in California. Uh, he said the precise question of when restrictions on particular social activities should be lifted during the pandemic is a dynamic and fact-intensive matter subject to reasonable disagreement. Our constitution principally entrusts the safety and health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the states. When those officials act in areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainties, their latitude must be especially broad. They should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary, which lacks the expertise to assess public health and is not accountable to the public. Well, this is a familiar refrain for our chief justice, right? Uh, judicial restraint, deference to uh, majorities, which, as, as Chris indicated in his opening remarks, is completely inconsistent with the notion of individual uh, rights guaranteed by the Constitution. So uh, that will certainly be a big theme that, uh, that will separate uh, different sides of, of these debates. In terms of the multiple important sets of issues, uh, I look at the ACLU as, as a bellwether because we do have offices all over the country. And at last count, there were more than 150 different lawsuits. And that's in addition to all of the advocacy and legislatures and the executive branch and so forth. Uh, a couple of days ago, there was a Forbes column um, in which the columnist said about the only thing federal courts are hearing these days are video sentences and American Civil Liberties Union cases. Uh, in fairness, a lot of the issues are joined in by government officials as well of all ideological stripes. So a lot of the issues are being resolved by consent uh, without the necessity for litigation. And I will illustrate that with the first specific basket of issues. And that has to do with uh, what has been called the most basic human right, namely to protect oneself from grave danger when one is held in government custody involuntarily in jail or in prison or in immigration detention, uh, the Supreme Court has for many decades now recognized that the government does have an obligation under the Eighth Amendment and also under the Due Process Clause uh, to protect inmates in terms of their health and, and medical uh, conditions, that there is an affirmative duty. The standard is quite deferential uh, to successfully challenge a government action as, as, as violating this affirmative duty. The plaintiffs have to show a deliberate indifference to a substantial risk of serious harm. That said, that is a standard that sadly has been satisfied by uh, many, many prisons and jails and detention facilities around the country given their inability to comply with the minimal social distancing and hygiene rules that have been prescribed by health experts. Uh, that said, there has been a lot of support across the 
ideological spectrum, including from within the government, within the prison system itself, uh, to very aggressively reduce populations, uh, concentrating on the inmates who are seen to be in greatest health danger themselves and to pose the least danger of recidivism. And this starts with uh, President Trump himself and his attorney general, uh, for example, on the immigration detention front in mid-March, um, ICE announced that it's going to arrest and place in detention only undocumented immigrants who have serious criminal convictions, a very important change in policy. Around the country, thousands of inmates have, have been uh, released. The CARES Act gives, and to various alternatives, including home confinement subject to uh, ankle monitors and sometimes transfers to other facilities that are not as overcrowded. The CARES Act that Congress passed uh, gives the Attorney General and the De uh, Bureau of Prisons authority to expand home confinement. And this has been a high priority for the Attorney General. He's issued two directives to the Federal Bureau of Prison calling on them to immediately maximize appropriate transfers to home confinement of all appropriate inmates. Since then, more than 4,000 inmates have been released from uh, federal prison, which is more than twice the usual case. Uh, and this is consistent with growing bipartisan support we've seen over the last decade for uh, reducing mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, Eugene and Julia, in our earlier pre-panel discussions, both raised the intriguing issue about the extent to which pandemic triggered measures will last beyond the pandemic and focusing on measures that reduce civil liberties. But I'm talking now about something that's the opposite and really, really a fascinating counter example is that pandemic in tr triggered decarceration policies that are consistent with uh, civil liberties advocacy have been advocated for a long time across the ideological spectrum. And perhaps the pandemic is forcing more momentum toward those reforms. Uh, in fact, ideologically diverse advocates are saying that they're hoping that this will be a tipping point. In addition to health pressures, there are also economic pressures again, ramping up the large number of people who are incarcerated in the United States. Um, well, and of course, in the past couple of weeks, all of the protests about uh, police abuse have increased the zeal and the momentum to implement reforms in the criminal legal system. Hey, Dean. I, is that my time? Well, Great. Um, what, I'd fine. like to move on to the other panelists. I and, appreciate that. And, We'll come back to you soon. Thank you. Next up is Professor Eugene Volk. Eugene, please. Thanks. Thanks very much. So I wanted to just talk uh, uh, briefly about some of these rights in two groups, because I think there are interesting similarities among them, some of these rights claims. Um, so one, one might think of as freedom of assembly and movement, freedom of gathering, perhaps, if you prefer a movement. Um, and that includes the assembly clause, uh, there have been, of course, restrictions on political gatherings, on uh, uh, gatherings to listen to lectures on art and science, all the things that are uh, gatherings in private universities, all the things that are uh, uh, protected by the assembly clause. And of course, there have been restrictions on religious gatherings, not on religious worship altogether, to the extent that you feel that it's adequate for your purposes to gather online, uh, you're free to do that. But for many people, it's important to gather together physically, and that's been restricted as well. And there, of course, have been restrictions on freedom of movement, driving from one home to a summer home, let's say. Um, uh, uh, and uh, those are things that, uh, generally speaking, very much parts of our constitutional rights. Uh, courts have upheld these, and I think they've upheld them correctly generally speaking. And uh, I think that's in part because freedom of assembly and of movement uh, are broadly accepted in large part because by and large, they by themselves are not particularly harmful. Uh, if you assemble with others in order to try to uh, foment crime, to advocate, let's say, crime and lead people perhaps to commit crime afterwards, well, that's something that is punishable, but it's punishable because of the, 
danger of, uh, 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 excuse me, that's something that's dangerous, excuse me, but it's not punishable unless it reaches the level of incitement because we protect this kind of the content of these kinds of communications, even if they're harmful. But for most assembly, most travel, nothing terribly harmful about it. The unfortunate thing about epidemics is it makes this ordinary, innocent behavior potentially deadly, deadly to the people engaging in it, deadly to other people they may infect. One way of thinking about it is, remember, the assembly clause protects the right of the people peaceably to assemble. So once you gather and then start acting violently, the assembly clause no longer protects it. Now, of course, from an intent perspective, when people who might or might not be infected with uh, a dangerous disease gather, they're peaceable in, in their hearts. They're not trying to do anything bad. Oh, but you might think of it as an example of something that's not quite a peaceable assembly because it is a, an assembly that... that causes danger of physical harm, kind of the way violent assemblies do, but through a different mechanism. So I think courts have rightly realized there are standard um, assumptions underlying the freedom of, uh, of assembly and travel uh, uh, don't really apply in times of epidemic. There's been ample precedent for that before. There have been plenty of quarantines and cordon sanitaire and other kinds of such restrictions in the past, uh, especially in a time of American history before modern medicine, um, uh, b before mass immunizations, let's say, when such epidemics were much more common. Uh, uh, so that's one class of things. So remember, this is people gathering together together in large numbers are traveling, often in ways that might spread the disease pretty far and wide. Here's, let, let's talk about a second class, and it's abortion and guns. You might not think the two should go together, but it's actually very interesting to compare abortion, abortion rights and gun rights in many ways. Uh, so uh, many states have uh, barred uh, elective medical procedures, or rather have suspended them and said, look, if there is something that isn't urgently necessary to protect your life and health, put it off. Put it off until... The, the disease, uh, uh, the epidemic, uh, um, uh, 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 the, uh, its magnitude abates in some measure. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, some of those states have said, well, abortion, unless it's necessary to preserve life and health, that's one such example. Pretty clear that the broad restrictions were not imposed just as an excuse to try to limit abortion. They limit way too many other things uh, to be simply an excuse. At the same time, there had to be a judgment as to whether abortion is treated like those uh, for medical procedures or like others, and unsurprisingly in some states, but not in other states, it was. Something very similar happened with regard to gun sales, uh, that uh, 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 a lot of non-essential businesses that sell goods have been closed down, uh, and uh, not all states, but some states have said, well, gun shops are non-essential businesses that sell goods, so they're closed down too. Um, again, not just an excuse to close down gun shops, uh, uh, they closed down many, many other things as well as we know, but they had to decide which side of the essential line this falls on. Um, and uh, uh, so there have been challenges to both, and these actually have sometimes succeeded, both on the abortion side, more often on the abortion side, but sometimes also on the gun side. There was a recent Connecticut decision a federal district court in Connecticut decision, accepting a gun rights claim that a recent California decision, rejecting it, some earlier decisions uh, going both ways as well. Um, and I think the difference is uh, that uh, uh, abortions and gun sales are performed usually with one person receiving and one or a couple uh, uh, providing. Uh, so the risk of contagion, well, of course, there any time two people there is a risk of contagion, but it's a lot less and it's a lot more manageable. It's a lot easier to maintain social distancing uh, uh, rules and other precautions. A and uh, uh, that's, I think, why one reason why courts have been uh, more open to uh, striking down such restrictions uh, or, or uh, at least striking them down in the sense of saying, like, for example, if an abortion, if, if, a, if a woman is at a point in her pregnancy where um, uh in a couple of weeks, or uh, uh, she'll no longer be legally allowed to have an abortion because she will pass the point of viability. Well, that delay is effectively denial, and that is unconstitutional. So, so interesting. I, I'm a big believer in thinking about how different rights are uh, similar and arguing that, well, you know, if you treat one right one way, you should treat another one a similar way. But you also have to recognize that they're different sometimes. You know, there's a, in the academy, there occasionally there's a jocularly people that discuss this lumpers and splitters. Some people are lumpers. They, they try to draw analogies. Uh, uh, some people are splitters. They try to draw distinctions. 
And of course, the joke is, of course, all of us should be lumpers in some ways and splitters in other ways, as, as the occasion requires. Um, uh, now, let me close with two things. One is um, uh, all of these restrictions, I think, are generally uh, permissible, or excuse me, to the extent they're permissible, they're permissible to the extent that they are neutral, to the extent that they really treat things equally. So, for example, it's quite clear that if they say, well, we'll shut down mosques and synagogues because we're afraid that uh, uh, there'll be spread of uh, uh, COVID, but not churches. Well, clearly unconstitutional. Of course, nobody's trying. Um, one consequence of that, as people have remarked, is uh, that now that many, many states uh, have uh, uh, basically uh, declined to enforce uh, any of the epidemic rules with regard to the Black Lives Matter protests, as a constitutional matter, it becomes much harder for them to enforce similar rules as to other protests as well. Um, they certainly can't say, well, Black Lives Matter protests, that's a really important message. So that trumps the public health interest. But for other, in, for other messages, they're not that important. That would be clearly unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. I suppose so they might argue, well, you know, Black Lives Matter protests just they were so big and seemed so hard to do anything to, to, to stop them that we decided in a matter of kind of enforcement discretion not to stop them. But I don't think that's going to go very far if in the future they say, well, this is a smaller protest. We can stop it, so we will. Because that seems to suggest that the more popular the idea, the more people believe in it, the more it's protected under the First Amendment. That can't be right, it seems to me. Um, so that's, I think, an important point. Now, one question is, to what extent can one broaden that and say, for example, well, why is it that church services are treated worse than uh, medical marijuana sales? And actually, I th I'm pretty hesitant about those kinds of inequality arguments, in part because, you know, sometimes lines need to be drawn. There are real distinctions between I mean, church services, a lot of people gather. In my sense, in marijuana dispensaries, not so much. Well, it's easy to sneer at marijuana uh, dispensaries. You know, the, in many states, they are treated as essentially the equivalent of pharmacies, rightly or wrongly. That's the way the legal system treats them. So as a result, they're treated kind of like pharmacies. I think that's the reason why they have, uh, have remained open. Um, so I'm hesitant about some of these equality uh, uh, arguments, but clearly when it comes to, say, one right, freedom of assembly, uh, you can't treat some assemblies differently. So let me close with one thing. Uh, people often worry uh, that uh, uh, restriction, even if sensible on its own, is going to last too long or is going to be kind of adopted more often than it ought to be. Uh, so, for example, concerns about surveillance. You know, you allow surveillance against terrorism, but then it's going to spread in lots of other areas. Or allow a wartime restriction. Well, then, especially since a war can be can go on for a very long time, uh, uh, it can go on forever. Well, one thing about these kinds of restrictions, especially ones that are relatively egalitarian or that treat people equally, um, is that they're politically self-limiting. They're tremendously expensive. They're financially expensive, they're expensive in terms of uh, uh, lost enjoyment of life. They're politically expensive uh, for politicians. They're financially expensive for politicians and that politicians want, by and large, to spend money on their favorite programs. And all of these restrictions have caused such tremendous economic uh, problems that uh, the consequence is much less tax revenue and much less outflow in order to uh, provide stimulus and the like. So there's lots of incentives to ease these things. This is not one of those things to say, oh, my God. Some people say, well, you start off with this war, you'll have a perpetual state of war. You're not going to have a perpetual state of shutdown, it seems to me. That's just not politically feasible. Okay. This is one area where I worry somewhat less about restrictions leading to broader restrictions and restrictions lasting way too long. There'll be some mistakes, but I think rarely way too long because of these political concerns. Eugene, thank you very much. Uh, we now turn to, Ju to Professor Julia Mahoney. Julia? Thank you. Um, thanks to the Federalist Society for organizing this event and for having me. I'm very much looking forward to our exchanges. So in the few minutes I have for my opening remarks, I'm going to make three sets of points. The first relates to the medium and long-term impact of government responses to COVID-19 on civil liberties. And in particular, I will explain why I think that it's possible that Eugene is being just a bit too optimistic when it comes to these medium and long term, but we can, we can discuss. The second involves constitutional structure and how in times of great upheaval, constitutional structure often functions as the most potent check on government, at least or so I would argue in the short term. And the third concerns property and economic rights and how a vision of civil liberties that encompasses these rights, which are sometimes something of a neglected stepchild in the pantheon of constitutional rights, 
has the potential, or so I would argue, to strengthen the US constitutional system. So let me take these one at a time. First, the medium and long-term consequences for civil liberties resulting from government responses to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, I understand why Eugene and many others have suggested that many, or even most, or even all, of the various restrictions put in place, are the new rules put in place, are not likely to be long-lasting, why they're going to be, as, they, as I think Eugene puts it, politically self-limiting. And at first glance, this claim makes a lot of sense. We look at colonial and US history, and what do we see? We see lots of epidemics, yellow fever, smallpox, malaria, and we see a lot of pretty significant government restrictions, quarantines, cordon sanitaire, closures of sporting events, closing of businesses, more rarely closing of schools. And then I think it is true that in general, in US and colonial history, once the danger has abated, things have at least on the surface gone back pretty much to normal, or at least that's been the standard story. So why do I think that COVID-19 could well mark a turning point and that it has the potential, not the certainty, but the potential to be a catalyst for lasting societal change? So for starters, it's recent US history. Never let a crisis go to waste has been the watchword, at least in the 21st century, among many, not all, but many members of the political class. COVID-19 is the third crisis in less than 20 years in which we have seen a lot of public officials, not all, I stress, but many, uh, try to harness the public emergency uh, in order, in, in the service of what I would describe as pre-existing partisan and policy objectives. Eugene is completely right that many of the restrictions put in place are very costly politically. Those are the ones I think, again, he's correct, we should worry about least, but plenty of government actions can, are not, are kind of opaque. And though those who put them in place will not necessarily pay much of a price, not if they're terribly skillful about it. In addition, widening the lens somewhat beyond America and the United States, there is history in general. There is a rich and to me at least fascinating literature on the after effects of epidemics, which not surprisingly has generated a lot of debates on whether and if so how various epidemics have transformed societies, have shifted political power, maybe from, from say landowners to laborers, thinking about some of the debates about the effects of the Black Death in England, the mid 14th century Black Death in England. We also have lively debates on the Antonin Plague in the second century in Rome. And again, it may well be that these diseases and government responses have affected, have brought about significant changes in society. This could, I believe, happen in the United States. Now I stress, getting back to one of the points that Nadine was making, it's not clear which direction this is going to go in. I certainly do not have any sort of crystal ball. There could be lasting effects, but it's not clear that there'll be lasting effects in the direction of greater control by government. We've already seen quite a bit of de-incarceration, as Nadine pointed out, accelerating a pre-existing trend toward um, uh, de-incarceration. We've also seen quite a bit of deregulation, and it um, is um, grimly humorous to see many states, including New York, suspend a lot of health regulations in order to protect public health. Right. But that is indeed what we saw. And some of these suspensions, I think, may well become permanent, especially as a lot of voters see that regulations however, have been suspended uh, the previous panel had, among other things, a discussion of the loosening of alcohol regulations, of uh, so-called curbside cocktails becoming a practice, and civilization hasn't ended, and we can certainly imagine that those, um, that those changes are going to be ongoing. And then getting back again to what Nadine said, it certainly is quite plausible that the de-incarceration trend is going to continue. Now, my second set of points about constitutional structure and how constitutional structure protects civil liberties. 
That too, or so I would argue, has been on full display during the COVID-19 crisis. During the COVID-19 crisis, legislatures and courts have been active. This has not been just the executive branches. It's not just the president, the executive branch of the federal government and the governors who are acting, not at all. And courts have been called upon to hear challenges to restrictions that have been imposed. And it comes as no surprise, thinking about uh, Justice Roberts' opinion that Nadine mentioned, um, it comes as no surprise that many judges and justices are very hesitant in the heat of a serious public health crisis to second guess the political branches. After all, they are making decisions under grave time pressure, under incredible uncertainty, particularly in something like COVID-19. We know a lot more about this virus than we did a few months ago, but we still don't know very much about it. So we can see why courts will, and judges will often hang back, but where courts and judges are confident of course, is when they're evaluating process. So it comes to, as no surprise to me that when we look at the successful challenges to a lot of these government measures put in place, we see that the successful challenges have raised procedural um, quarrels, have in effect said, wait, you can't do this. You're not going through the correct channels. We saw this from the Supreme Court of Wisconsin in a four to three decision. Uh, and we saw that too recently from the Michigan Supreme Court in a case involving a barber. One of the justices of the Michigan Supreme Court said flat out, it is incumbent on the courts to ensure decisions are made according to the rule of law, not hysteria. So it, where various measures have not jumped through all the hoops, have not been in accordance with constitutional structure, that is when courts, I believe, feel at their most confident and are the most likely to take action. Finally, to my third point about property and economic rights as civil liberties. Since roughly the New Deal era, to paint with a very broad brush, property and economic rights have been, again, painting with a very broad brush, something of neglected rights, or at least often deemed to be not as important as some of the other rights that we have been discussing. COVID-19, I think, highlights just how important rights of to participate in the economy and to um, have one's property value up to a point protected in the face of government action, just how important these rights are to human flourishing and how hard, perhaps impossible, it is to disentangle them from these higher profile rights that tend to get more publicity, the rights of religious free exercise, speech, travel, abortion, guns, etc. The ability to make a living is at the heart of many of the challenges. And these challenges, interestingly to me, are arising against a backdrop where there has been a trend for plaintiffs who challenge occupational licensing regimes to win, or at least be more likely to win than they used to be. Finally, a word about takings challenges. There have been a lot of takings claims raised in response to government restrictions, and these takings claims are, of course, hard to win. But I would at least suggest that courts take a very careful look at these takings challenges, because while courts may, as we've been discussing, hesitate to enjoin government action in time of grave emergency, absent some serious deviation from, um, from procedure, it's another matter to order compensation of business owners and others who have suffered particularly heavy losses, who have in effect been asked to bear more of the burden of the COVID-19 responses. Once things have settled down, once the grave emergency has passed, it is easier, I think, for courts to order compensation. They're not, after all, interfering with the political branch's response to a grave public health crisis. And I think these considerations of compensating those on whom the burden has fallen quite hard are especially compelling if one is concerned about cronyism and favoritism and anti-competitive government action. Those who suffer the greatest losses often lack political power, and so compensating them can blunt the inequalities that often flow from, in, from unequal political power, and that in turn, or so I would argue, 
can make our constitutional structure more robust. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Mila. Julia, thank you very much. Um, Professor Mila Versteeg, Julia's colleague at UVA. Mila, please proceed. Great, thank you so much for having me here. So as the last speaker of the day, I take it, I'm going to uh, take a comparative perspective on, on these events uh, because the issues that the US is facing are very similar to the issues that obviously that other democracies are facing. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say, as I think Nadine also raised, this is never before have we seen such a major drop in civil liberties around the world in, in democracies as during this current pandemic. And some of the measures have been mentioned. We've seen nationwide stay-at-home orders, suspended religious services, cell phone monitoring, uh, censoring of news in some places. And it's actually also interesting that even though there is obviously variation in the response across countries, there is also the initial response was often quite similar. All countries no matter the exact circumstances, pretty much decided they needed some form of lockdown, right? So lockdowns is, is what we've seen. Uh, so in this, and, and so, and we also opinion poll uh, research from these different countries shows these measures are widely accepted by publics, but everywhere uh, we've seen debates over some of the issues that Eugene raised and Julia raised, right? What, uh, and Chris raised, what does this do long-term for civil liberties in these places? Is there a risk for abuse? Uh, do we see the constitution constrain uh, executive power? Uh, uh, what does it mean for democracy in the long run? It's even a question that, uh, that that's raised in some countries. So in, my, in this brief talk, I wanna say something about, the, I think the extent to which we should be worried about this uh, as a long-term phenomenon, sort of picking up uh, on what Eugene said and what Julia said, but maybe from a slightly different angle. So I've been together with a co-author, I've been working on a project where we've basically been surveying uh, the COVID response in, in every country and so far we've done this for 70 countries and specifically to what extent this has been a, a phenomenon of an executive acting on his or her own versus to what extent have we seen the constitution be invoked have we seen courts involved legislatures involved and also subnational units of so states within federal systems but mayors uh, governors and, and so on involved in this response uh, and because the traditional image and that's it's the, an image that some people are worried about is one of an unconstrained executive right once we have an emergency we don't let it go to waste uh, the um, uh, the executive executive amasses an enormous amount of power, other branches delegate, the courts defer to the executive, legislatures delegate power, and law kind of goes away, right? This is a well-known view of emergency power that basically goes back to Carl Smith, uh, but that has remained influential uh, until this day. And one of the key findings so far, if we look at democracies, is that that has not been what has happened in mo most places. So in most places, we've actually seen a lot of involvements by courts, uh, court more so than in the US perhaps, have courts inserted themselves in questions of, of, of scrutinizing uh, the lockdown measures on constitutional grounds. We've seen legislators being involved, passing brand new laws, and we see subnational units, states within federal systems, but not even just states, sometimes provinces or cities resist lockdown orders or, or impose them when the central government doesn't. So what we've seen is actually something like much more of a dialogue between different branches. So I wanted to, and, and I actually think that's a good thing. In a world where we don't know uh, what the right response is, and nobody really knows what the right response to this current crisis is, maybe the best we can do is make sure that multiple actors are involved, right? That may ensure that reduces the risk of making a colossal mistake, right? So having dialogue between branches, different parts of government is probably useful. So let me say something, I, because I guess for this, the purpose of this audience uh, on this research on the different ways that courts around the world have involved themselves in these questions. Uh, so, so, and I, I, we, we basically looked at the cases, some uh, cases in some 30 countries and, and read them to the extent we could. Uh, and I think there's four, I'm now I'm going to be a lumper uh, and not a splitter, uh, but like the, there's four different, broad different ways that courts have involved themselves. So one is what Julian predicted would be most common, which is ensure uh, that proper procedures are followed and that separation of powers are uh, rule, 
the separation of power framework in the constitution is, uh, is upheld. So we saw, for example, actually the very first court that got involved in this was the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. And it struck down the entire lockdown order in the country because it was passed uh, by, uh, by the executive alone based on regulation and was not based on legislation. Uh, and basically said, well, you can't do this until you've passed a law. And then the law was passed. Uh, some say that this only means that now the executive, that the country has to jump through some procedural hoop. Others would say that's actually important, right? You have legislative uh, involvement. Uh, the Israeli Supreme Court has said that the government can't do cell phone monitoring without involving the Israeli parliament. Uh, without that, it's in, in contradiction with the basic law. Uh, so we've seen a whole bunch of these sort of procedural cases. Uh, but that's not the only type of case we see. So we also see courts in... Uh, in different countries actually doing the kind of substantive rights review that Julia predicts won't really happen uh, and hasn't been as common in the US in any case. Uh, and that Nadine was talking about uh, just making sure, like are, scrutinizing, are these measures necessary? Are they temporary? Are they narrowly tailored? Are they proportional is usually the framework that many foreign courts use. Uh, so the German constitutional court has says, well, you can't ban gatherings uh, if they take social distancing measures in, in, into account into account. Uh, you can ban religious services if they can adhere to social distancing guidelines. Uh, South Africa, just last week, a case came out where the high court basically said that uh, the government had failed to explain why you could run on the boulevard, but then next to the beach. But once you entered the beach, you were no longer there because uh, allowed to run there because the beaches were closed. And so that's just doesn't make sense, right? Go explain to us why these rules seem so arbitrary. So, and, and short of that, this was simply unconstitutional. Uh, even, I mean, even in the US, I guess the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that held that Kentucky couldn't simply ban religious services because, I mean, you, you have to explain if you keep open laundromats and liquor stores, uh, then uh, with social distancing, you should also be able to do the same for, uh, for religious services. So that's, so we actually see some of those cases. And I think that's interesting because courts are really inserting themselves there in the substantive questions. And uh, then third, we see uh, cases where courts are demanding action. So they're actually asking government to do stuff. And this is kind of uncommon in the United States because you can't violate the constitution if you do nothing, but that's not true under international human rights law or constitutional law of most countries. So in Brazil, a court actually imposed a lockdown in the city where the healthcare system had collapsed, right? So the government failed to act, the president Bolsonaro notoriously has failed to act. Uh, so the court, Im a court imposed a lockdown. Uh, the, the, the highest court of Brazil has also held that the government is under an obligation to provide accurate information about the virus. So Bolsonaro couldn't just go around saying, oh, this is just a little flu and have propaganda videos saying this wasn't real, that he had to provide accurate information to uh, the country. In India, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that public health insurance should pay for tests. Uh, there's a lot of cases like that where often their right to health, which is a right that's not recognized in the US constitution, but is recognized in other constitutions, is used to, to require to demand that governments actually do stuff. Um, finally, uh, there's a number of cases we found that are that is a, that are about postponing elections. <laughs> so obviously, the question of whether elections should be held or postponed is a very difficult one. Uh, there's not clear there is a right or wrong answer. Uh, it's also not clear that courts have a right or wrong answer. But what they can do is, of course, try to screen out. Uh, ulterior motives for uh, postponing elections. So we've seen some cases where they try to do that. There's an interesting case from the Polish Supreme Court uh, and others, although thus far, every single one of the cases we found, courts actually said the election should go ahead as planned. Uh, we haven't found a single one where the court said they, uh, they should be postponed. So, okay, so that's um, so that's some flavor. Okay, I guess I'm out of time as well. So this is what- Just point, uh, just point up. Okay, yeah, this is what uh, what we've seen that courts have been doing. As I said, we also seen a lot of legislative involvement. So in some 60% of the democracies we looked at, brand new legislation was passed, right? So like in the UK, there is the COVID-19 bill that is, uh, 
gives additional power to the prime minister, but only applies for 21 days. So here it's not legislators deferring to the executive, but rather they're just handing new powers to the, um, um, but uh, I'm sorry, they're actively legislating in the face of this crisis. And then finally, we see the, the subnational resistance. So states resisting presidents uh, and a back and forth between the national and the subnational level. So I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, we'll come back to you. Uh, this has been, uh, I'd like to say, an extraordinary, uh, ri extraordinarily uh, rich uh, and substantial uh, set of uh, presentations. Uh, thank you uh, very much, all. I'd like to begin <clears throat> by asking each of you if you would like to, having listened to the others, uh, respond to others, ask questions, revise and extend your own remarks, change your position. Uh, you've been persuaded, and I'm just going to ask everybody to do that, but I want to start with Nadine because I, I cut her off a little bit, and I think she wanted to make a few more points. So, <laughs> there was, there was, thank, thank you so much. There was an infinite Re amount. I could have revise, revise and extend, uh, uh, take things, or uh, ask questions of your co-panelists. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, this was absolutely fascinating. Thanks to all of you. Uh, Mila, as you were talking about uh, the fact that the United States generally only imposes negative obligations on the government rather than affirmative, of course, the, the one exception is when the government is holding people in custody, at least the, the major one that occurs to me, right, uh, where the court has actually acknowledged because of uh, the rationale that the government is incapacitating that person from taking care of himself or herself that does extremely unusually in our constitutional system impose certain affirmative duties on the government. So uh, that explains all of the, the, the prison cases. With respect to voting issues in this country, the main flurry of debate and litigation has been over the extent to which uh, the 16 states that do not already automatically entitle everybody to vote by mail should be required to do so without any procedural impediments. And uh, of these 16, I believe some have already uh, it voluntarily implemented those reforms. Interestingly enough, uh, states with both Republican and Democratic majorities uh, and, and Democratic and Republican uh, governors, but there are others who are resisting, and this it really plays out in a national debate. In fact, there was a headline in today's USA Today uh, that was basically, let's see, I have it here somewhere, but um, basically pitting Donald Trump against Joe Biden because um, the conventional wisdom seems to be that it would be uh, voting fraud that would disenfranchise Republicans. Here's the head headline. Biden and Trump both warn the other side may steal the election as the fight over mail voting rages. So even though there's, there's reason to contest the underlying assumptions, um, there seemed to be some partisan drive where the Democrats seem to uh, feel that they would be advantaged by more vote by mail and, and and at least some Republicans disagree with that. So that's how uh, that's being fought out in courts all over the country. Thank you. Uh, Eugene, on the question of long-term uh, effects, has Julia turned you around? Uh, or you know, are you just talking about different aspects of the same question? Right. I think um, I'm inclined to say that at least the kinds of restrictions I talk about are going to go away on their own. But it may very well be that others might not, other kinds of regulations, other kinds of deregulations. I want to talk very briefly about privacy. We haven't talked much about it, but there's talk about, uh, about contact tracing apps, which may require you to have them on the phone or may. The first cut that people say is let's have people voluntarily put these apps because they're in their own interest as well so that they can be notified if they may have been exposed to, uh, to someone uh, who, who's infected. Uh, but if that doesn't yield enough uh, uh, uptake on the public's part and indications are that it won't, um, what about mandated uh, contact tracing and such? So those things, once adopted, may very well spread. And I think there's a very serious reason to be concerned. But I want to flag a broader point here. Um, we often talk about trade-offs between 
liberty and privacy on one side and safety on the other. And of course, some such trade-offs have to be made. The Fourth Amendment, for example, doesn't ban all searches and seizures, could a, to maximally protect liberty and privacy, but then you have no safety, right? So that's why there are attempts to balance those. But I want to suggest that this is an area where we might be seeing a trade-off between privacy and liberty. So let's say there is a next wave, uh, as there very likely will be, of infection, that until we get a vaccine, part of the problem is there's huge problem now happening in Mexico. And the border being famously porous, there's no way, there's going to be no way of stopping reinfection for Mexico, even if things completely die down in the U.S. And that's just the clearest example. Unless we totally shut down international trade, there'll be other forms of reinfection and within the country as well. So it may be that one of the things we'll be facing is, do we have more privacy? But then the consequences, once we get a second wave, which could be even worse than the first, then we have to have less liberty because everything gets shut down. Or do we have less privacy? We say, hey, the government's going to be able to track you now for the sake of, uh, uh, of um, uh, protecting against reinfection. But then at least when there's a new wa next wave, first of all, it's less likely there will be a serious next wave. And if there is, then we'll have more effective ways of dealing with it that don't require a shutdown. That could be a difficult problem that we are going to have to be facing within the coming months. I, I completely agree with the point Gene is making, but if I can make it even more complicated, uh, I wouldn't Always even... Always good to make it more complicated. <laughs> I, a wouldn't, lot of professors. I wouldn't draw, a, so I guess this makes me a splitter. Um, I wouldn't draw a distinction between liberty and privacy. I would say there are, there are liberty concerns on both sides here for the reason that you explained. But in terms of the inter... I mean, the more government surveillance there is, certainly of communications technology, through study after study, according with common sense, that the more we are subject to that kind of surveillance, the more of a chilling impact it has on our exercise of classic civil liberties in terms of freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, religious liberty, and so forth. I think that, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely right. Liberty and privacy are closely interrelated. I would say that there is a difference between restrictions on liberty and on privacy. Uh, it's more burdensome, for example, to say to people that, they can't speak out about elections, then that if they do speak out, they've got to disclose something about themselves. Both are restraints on liberty, but one is less than the other. But there's no doubt uh, that they closely interact with each other. Absolutely right. Very good. Uh, others? Uh, Julia, you've heard some other people speak. Mila? Oh, I, you know, I can't talk to any of you until midnight, but I will limit myself to one brief question for each of my co-panelists. Nadine, with de-incarceration, are you concerned at all about a possible backlash? If this is done under great pressure, if it's done in an awkward, in a way that is not perhaps well thought out, um, are you concerned that the uh, public support for de-incarceration might fall? With Eugene, thinking about these restrictions and which ones are politically self-limiting, are you worried that some of them aren't? You mentioned surveillance, and frankly, beefed up surveillance would be at the top of my list of, in, of, um, of changes to civil liberties or things that could possibly uh, raise concerns for civil liberties that aren't going to be politically self-limiting in the same way because, in part, because they tend not to be so expensive and not... Mm -hmm. not obvious to the people who are right. right. I think the clearest example is surveillance. I have to say, and this could be viewed as unduly pessimistic or realistic or neither, but uh, I think uh, that, sur that we're going to be seeing much more surveillance no matter what in, in the years and decades to come. Part of it, I've always, I've long thought this because uh, uh, of the ease of the greater ease of technology available to small groups of people, including terrorists, uh, and that uh, you're going to have more and more risk of, for example, terrorists using biological weapons, and not just you know as plagues go, <laughs> this is nothing. I mean, it's very sad to see the people who died, but as best we can tell, the uh, infection fatality rate is under one percent for smallpox. It's, by understanding, it's about thirty percent. Uh, and uh, while we have an immunization against smallpox, uh, if there's a new strain, this could be devastating. And my guess is that one of the things we're going to need to do in order to prevent that in the future, and possibly radiological weaponry and various other things, is have more and more surveillance. 
I'll give you another example. I think, uh, 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 obviously, policing is tremendously necessary. I mean, I think when people say defund the police, they don't really mean that. Uh, uh, and to the extent they do, that's a losing proposition for them because all of us need police protection. At the same time, it's not clear to me that the right way of enforcing traffic laws, the way that is best for liberty as a whole, is to have police pull people over for traffic violations. It seems to be much more sensible to have police video record them have it sent in and then have a citation sent to, to the person. And they, then the police, rather than stopping the car and then running a, uh, a license check or running some other kind of check, uh, the, the police might just have the computer sort of see the license plate, say the license, the car is owned by this person. Here's a photo, pull up alongside him. Does it look like this person? So on balance, it may be that a greater surveillance mechanism red light cameras, various other things, properly constrained, there are all sorts of possible risks with that, uh, is actually going to be better for civil liberties and will allow us to actually have fewer police citizen encounters for those things which don't need to risk turning into something uh, very bad and limit those to situations where you really are trying to stop someone in the middle of a violent crime or a property crime or some such. But again, that's going to involve more surveillance. So yes, I think the surveillance that we're going to have set up here is going to stay. But I think that's part of a broad trend towards more and more surveillance that I do not think is reversible. And I do not think on balance ought to be reversible. Well, I'll chime in on that and also answer Julia's great question to me. Uh, Julia, you referred to the three crises in the last 20 years. So the first of those, of course, was 9-11. And the Patriot Act, with its vastly increased surveillance powers with respect to communications of those of us who aren't even suspected of any kind of illegal conduct, let alone terrorism, uh, were initially enacted with a quite strict sunset provision, right? And that sunset has been extended and extended and extended. And those surveillance provisions, mass surveillance, are still in effect, even after the uh, revelations by Edward Snowden and the seeming impetus to reform. So sadly, uh, I agree with Eugene that that surveillance is likely to increase, not, not decrease. Um, with respect to your great question to me, Julia, uh, it ha the devil is, of course, in the details. And that is why it's really important that a specific criteria for determining who will be eligible for removal and what kind of removal, it doesn't necessarily mean outright right release, is really, really important. One very worrying concern is the absence of opportunities for reintegration that exists in our current cluster of laws and regulations, which make people who have been incarcerated, who have been convicted, ineligible for a whole host of opportunities and services that would seem to be necessary in order to help them make an, a successful transition back into society. So it's not enough just to dump them out, so to speak. Uh, we really need a lot of other reforms. And uh, it may be hard to do that in a time of such great economic difficulties with uh, such high unemployment rates. So you're very right to, uh, to point out that this requires a lot more thinking and, and planning and further policy steps. Uh, let me ask if you have anything you would like to add or ask. Well, maybe to really comments, uh, not questions, but uh, on the question on the issue of surveillance that I think in the sort of the European countries that I've been following, this is probably one of the biggest debates as well, right? Everybody is thinks these lockdowns will end uh, and will return to normal, but there is these big debates over legislation being passed that allows for this kind of surveillance. And, and also in general, uh, there is more of a concern with privacy and privacy of data in Europe, I would say, than there is in this country. There's stricter regulations on this as well. And, and nonetheless, they're considering this. And for the reasons I think that Eugene points out, this is ultimately what, what produces more liberty, probably. Uh, so we may just have to do this. But it's, it's a, a difficult and controversial issue. Uh, second 
thing I just want to mention uh, uh, in response to Dean's point about the, the mail-in uh, election or postal ballots and elections. So there was actually the, the case before the Supreme Court of uh, Poland where the Polish Supreme Court says you cannot just simply change to a, a postal election because that affects the constitutional essence of the election, uh, turns the pol uh, post office into election officers and the post office isn't equipped to be election officers and it marginalizes the role of our electoral com uh, election commission that we have. Uh, so unless there was major constitutional and or legislative reform, it would not be constitutional. So I, obviously it's a very different uh, setting, but I, I do think it, it's interesting because it touched upon the issues it raises. Oh, well, that's so fascinating, Mila. Was there a dissent or was it unanimous? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But obviously there was a, a, a pretextual situation going on there whereby the, the ruling government thought that this was by holding the elections sooner, uh, they would be more likely to be reelected. So clearly that was going on. Uh, so, yeah. I, I want to emphasize the point that this surveillance and privacy issues uh, are probably going to become more salient in this next phase than they were in the past. If you just say everybody has to stay home for a month, we're treating everybody uh, alike. But when you get into a situation, especially on contact uh, tracing, uh, I know of cases in some states where people have been asked to quarantine, an out-of-stater, completely asymptomatic, asked to quarantine for two weeks, and the police come to your house a week later to make sure you're still there. In other states, um, they've actually said, this is the honor system. And uh, there's, there's a lot of divergence there. Uh, but but we're going to see uh, in several states uh, some some active surveillance and some and some big cases coming up. I um, in in listening to the uh, justifications of these various measures that have been taken, uh, there's there's been a sort of a consistent uh, confusion or overlap as to what the government is trying to accomplish. Uh, sometimes. It sounds like it is a paternalistic self-protection, uh, like a motorci motorcycle helmet law, that we're doing these things to protect ourselves because otherwise we might be sick. Sometimes it sounds like we're protecting immediate bystanders, pe people that are right around us. That would be, be like a dog leash law, I suppose, just something in the immediate vicinity. Uh, and then in other cases, the strongest justification is that this is necessary for achieving an important public health goal that requires some substantial amount of uh, degree of individual compliance. That makes it like a vaccine requirement. Does it make a difference in how we assess the civil liberties burdens um, what the justification is? And the government is sometimes inconsistent. It's pretty clear that these are being done for general public health services, uh, purposes, but then government officials make it sound like you better do this or you're going to get sick. So it makes it moves it right much more to the paternalistic uh, sense. Well, I, well, I have a stronger case uh, for challenging the effectiveness of these uh, rules uh, based upon one purpose or another. Well, I can see that agitated a lot of uh, a lot of thought. What do you think about it, Chris? I have I I, I just I've not seen a case. There's an enormous amount of debate about the um, effectiveness of the lockdown orders and the effectiveness of many things that are being done right now. I've not seen a legal challenge uh, based upon the fact that this had no rational basis to the protection of public health. Maybe, maybe there have been some of these cases where you close a beach or you close a public park and it doesn't seem to be related to anything at all. Uh, but I've, I've not seen a strong uh, civil liberties attack on any of these things on the ground of ineffectiveness. Am I wrong? Well, well but um, so I the way I'm thinking case. about it, one is, is there a rational basis? And certainly under standard rational basis scrutiny, the answer is sure. Uh, right, of course. You could say it's completely irrational. And the very fact that we don't know 
what's going to work and what's not makes experimenting uh, with things on an emergency basis more rational. The second question is, how much does the government have to prove? And almost uniformly, the courts have said, not much, because this is not something on which we can really expect really serious proof, because it's very difficult, complex systems, the human body and human society. And J Jacobson v. Massachusetts, 1905 case, but on this, I think the court uh, uh, courts continue to, to, to treat this uh, as, as highly instructive, at least, um, says, look, when we're trying to figure out the pluses and minuses of various approaches to compulsory vaccination, it's requiring people to stick things in their, uh, stick uh, uh, dangerous medicine, essentially, in their own body, um, that's something that uh, uh, courts should defer to executive judgment on, especially in the context of a public health emergency. I think that remains the general view, and I think it's probably right, because why should we think that a judge is going to do a great job of trying to figure something out that, in fact, public health experts they don't know either. Can I, I don't know. Can I, can I complexify really, really. that? Thanks. Complexify, yes, even more. Right. So Jacobson v. Massachusetts, 1905 precedent. It's not about someone actually having to be vaccinated. It's about whether someone can be fined. And I think that's really important that the court says this, this fine is okay. But it wasn't, if I recall correctly, about whether or not someone actually had to produce themselves right. and get jabbed. And... I think in terms of Chris's question, um, and this ties into the question I want to ask Mila, which we didn't get to, but, um, but bear with me for a moment. Chris's question about why there haven't been challenges yet about the ineffectiveness perhaps of it, I say it's just too soon because it seems to me that the first stage, uh, courts are willing to look carefully at what governments are doing with separation of powers and structural arguments and process arguments and so forth but that they're not, they, they really do seem to step back, at least initially in the short term, from, un, from being willing to scrutinize on any, on any um, level of scrutiny, however you might, 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 might want to put that. It seems to me then the next stage, and Mila can tell me whether I, I have this right, courts are likely to look carefully at whether what the government is doing is an outlier. At that, at that next stage, it's often, it becomes a little easier to get a court to look carefully at something um, and one of the most uh, useful arguments, I think, does tend to be, well, look, look what this government is doing. No one else is doing this. This is just way more restrictive. And then finally, um, we begin to see more, uh, look, more examination of the substance. And I think that examination of the substance is going to come. Um, in fact, it's coming already. But anyway, I'd love to hear whether Mila thinks that, I'm, that my taxonomy is, is roughly correct or not. I think that's possible, although there were some courts that jumped in pretty early on substantive questions, like the German Constitutional Court, for example, yeah. uh, or other courts in Europe that have said, well, if you, you explain us why children have to stay home, because that's not clear that there is any reason for singling out young people, for example, which is the case. Uh, but, but I do want to also, I guess, maybe to what others have said, push back on this idea that courts are not suitable decision makers here. I mean, nobody has perfect information, right? It's not clear. Like ep epidemiologists are not running the country. They have elected officials. They are, everybody is weighing the same imperfect information. It's not obvious to me that courts are worse, uh, like in the worst position to judge this information than elected officials. Really not clear to me at all. So I think it's important to have these different actors check each other on these questions. And I think, I hope we'll see more of that going forward, yes. Also, I don't think there hasn't been any litigation about this, but some of the uh, technology ideas that were floated have been, as far as I understand, by consensus rejected because a consensus has developed that they wouldn't be effective. So uh, early on, there were suggestions that we could all use mobile phone location apps for contact tracing, but then it, uh, and in fact, it was tried. Uh, somewhere, and the consensus was that it's not granular enough information to show whether we've been in close enough proximity for a long enough time to possibly be infected. Thank you very much. Uh, we have arrived at uh, question time. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes for attendees uh, to pose questions or uh, a, a, a pertinent and pithy comments uh, as well. Uh, if you wish to uh, introduce a question or comment, uh, 
uh, you should, if you are on Zoom, uh, hit the raise hand button on your screen. If you're on a phone, hit the star nine button. Please, uh, that will put you in a queue on my page. Uh, please wait till I call on you. When I call on you, our technical people will unmute you, but you should unmute yourself uh, and uh, be be before you speak. Uh, we have uh, several people who are already, uh, who have already raised their hand. And uh, the first three people I'm gonna call on are Karen Lugo, Cameron Atkinson, and Eric Rasmussen. We'll start with Karen Lugo, please. Please unmute yourself, Karen. Am I unmuted now? I'm sorry, I didn't yes, you know. Are. Yes, okay. please proceed. I'll read fast. Um, there's been a growing demand for constitutional clarity by the public. Um, some cases are actually apparently being mooted by governments as they reach the courts. And there's been an ongoing discussion about this on Volok conspiracy. Um, I'm actually part of supporting litigation in Florida and would like to use this particular executive order as an example where, although this governor has been called out as a positive example of, of managing the crisis in many ways, um, one of the executive orders alone talks about quarantine, but yet these standards have to do with four states, including anyone coming from an area of substantial community spread. Orders like this have, have been in place for months and they also entail criminal penalties. They're not updated, not scaled to curve flattening. So the public is baffled as to when and where to get the constitutional clarity as to when police power has gone on for too long, gone too far. And so rather than learning from popularized examples like the, you know, we'll call it civil disobedience of the Dallas hair salon owner, um, when, how do, do general citizens understand that some of these orders, um, because of their constitutional infringement on civil liberties, um, should be challenged? Great question, Karen. Panelists? You know, uh, I, maybe I'm missing the exact nature of the question, but if the question is, if you're a member of the public, how do you know what the rule is? Like when you hear about news stories, should you be outraged or not? What's the rule? The answer is there's not a very clear rule in part because how do rules become more clear in our system? Through a process of repeated litigation. I can tell you a good deal now about free speech law because the court mm -hmm. has decided hundreds of free speech cases, including in recent decades, so we don't have to look back a century. But thankfully, we haven't had a lot of cases in recent years having to do with this from the US Supreme Court. So as a result, the law, we have to say the law is not completely clear. A few things seem pretty clear that the government does have broad authority here, but the limitations it's sort of the nature of at least our common law system, and I use common law broadly, a system where a lot of the decisions are made by judges rather than purport to be set forth in some comprehensive code, and maybe the nature of all systems that it's hard to know what the rules are. Now, as to the question of what should be challenged, well, you can certainly challenge whatever you have the inclination and lawyer fees uh, uh, to challenge, and people are challenging, and sometimes they may say, I don't care what the precedents are, I'm trying to shift the precedents. Totally, totally understood. But I don't think we can expect great clarity in this area of the law, uh, in large part because, first of all, life is complicated. My father likes to, uh, to, use, to use the phrase, it's vague like life itself. So life is complicated, but also there's been fortunately relatively little occasion for the Supreme Court or even lower courts to chime in on this until the last few months for many decades now. So as a result, why should we expect to have a really crisp, clear uh, rule of law in this situation, especially since on top of that, the facts on the ground are both changing and our understanding of the facts on the ground uh, uh, is changing. I like clarity in the law. I think in a lot of areas we should expect clarity. I think in a lot of areas the law could be a lot clearer than it is. I just don't think this is one of them. Well, and to use Julia's wonderful word of complexifying even more, um, this is a matter of state statutory law. That's also true. Ordinances, and there may be whole separate bodies of 
case law for each state and each jurisdiction that's involved. Yes. But that said, I think we are going to get a little bit of clarity. In particular, the big, big thing that we're all waiting for, I think anyway, is some information about asymptomatic transmission. Unlike other epidemics where if there was asymptomatic transmission, that wasn't really on the radar screen of regulators. And at that point, when there are some discerned facts about asymptomatic transmission or the lack thereof, then courts are, I think, picking up on what Mila was saying a few minutes ago, courts are going to be much more confident in deciding where they're going to draw the boundary of permissible exercises of the police power. But if it really does become clear, let's say there's no asymptomatic uh, transmission and, and like all the health experts say there's no need at this point to have lockdowns. You just need to have, every, I don't know, have everybody get uh, 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 temperature, their temperature measured uh, to see if they're running a fever or something. Imagine that that's so. It's true that at that point, the courts might be fairly well armed and fairly willing to strike things down, but it's not clear they're going to have anything to strike down at that point because it's not terribly likely that most government officials will say, ah, we don't care. Because again, they, they're facing lots of political incentive to, to open things up as well. Uh, and so, and especially since we've seen, in fact, a lot of states are already opening up, even in the face of the risk of asymptomatic transmission, uh, 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 executive, uh, uh, governors and mayors have shown a willingness to change the policies in light of, uh, of uh, uh, changing evidence. You can imagine some outlier who's, who's crazy or who is sort of politically captured by one side or the other, uh, or, or, or maybe just way, way, way too cautious except judges historically are the, are the branch that is, tends to be more cautious, uh, th- that, you know, the judges can step in uh, and trump that. But I just don't think that's terribly likely. I think if it does become clear enough that some of these things are no longer rational, by and large, they are going to get shut down in most places by the executive and maybe by the legislature before they get shut down by judges. But what we're probably going to find is that there is no asymptomatic transmission, but there is pre-symptomatic transmission, which right. then makes it much more complicated again. We have, um, uh, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, seven or 10 minutes left. Uh, I have seven questions. I'd like to get through as many of them as I can. So, so let's be brief and to the point. Uh, the next question is from Cameron Atkinson. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeMuth. Uh, My question's for everyone. I've been involved in two cases in the drafting process for challenges to Connecticut's coronavirus restrictions. And one of the problems we're running into court here is we don't get to the necessary argument, the effectiveness arguments. We get stopped dead in our tracks on the standard of scrutiny in what Connecticut courts and the Second Circuit Courts have applied is using Jacobson to develop its own standard of scrutiny. And given Jacobson's place in American constitutional law as pre-incorporation and pre-scrutiny doctrine, pre-strict scrutiny, um, they have not been very receptive even on enumerated rights claims. Can Jacobson's um, unreasonable and arbitrary and unnecessary standard of scrutiny be reconciled with modern constitutional jurisprudence? I'm just going to say hi to Cameron. Nice to hear from you. Cameron finally hosted me pre-pandemic at his law school. Nice to hear from you again. Well, on Jacobson v. Massachusetts, I would push back hard because I, as, as my exchange with Eugene just, I think, suggested, I think that that is a, a far weaker precedent for, um, for government, uh, for near untrammeled government power than um, is, uh, is, is, is generally thought. So I, I suggest you contact me and we can talk offline about this. Uh, very good. Uh, next is uh, Eric Rasp. Eric? Okay, hi, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm wondering how any civil liberties restriction can be worse than telling people they have to close down their business, close their church, be jailed if they go to a funeral, be fined $1,000 for having a wedding and so forth. And location tracking seems utterly, completely, awesomely trivial compared to that. 
So why are we talking about it? Um, and why are civil libertarians complaining more about that? Because when they do talk, I hear things about trivial things like if your neighbor sees you coughing, can we really tell the neighbor that you've got COVID-19 or is that an infringement on your, uh, your HIPAA rights? And I think maybe Chris had the, the most had the answer that we aren't worried because everybody is treated equally. And it's gonna to get tough only when sick people get surveilled. But there, I think under our current equality fetish, Stal it's kind of a Stalinism problem we've got. Stalinism, remember, oppressed everybody equally. And even his executions and arrests were mostly random after 1930. There were no Trotskyites or records left. It was just a matter of, of uh, terrorizing everybody. And I wonder if current jurisprudence would say that's fine um, in America, especially since everything he did was perfectly legal. If you say what is legal is what the courts say is legal, rather than using natural law or originalism or plain meaning or something like that, that like Eugene was saying, we don't even know what's illegal yet because the courts haven't ruled. It's like if you ask me if I can play the tuba, I'd say, I don't know. I've never tried. So why aren't you more worried? Thank you. Well, I mean, isn't this, I think, one of the things we've been, we've been talking about here? Um, these are tremendous burdens on liberty. Uh, they're not Stalin, most certainly, but they're tremendous burdens on liberty. Uh, we've been living under them for two to three months. Now they're already easing. Uh, they will probably be largely gone within two or three more months. Uh, there's no doubt that they're tremendously serious. I don't think libertarians say that, say that they're not tremendously serious, but I think many libertarians or many people, I'm not a libertarian, I'm libertarian-ish. I'm kind of libertarian sympathizer in some respects. Uh, I think many recognize that in extraordinary times when the normal circumstances of the non-aggression principle where we can go out there and do anything we want so long as we don't hurt others don't quite apply because we might be hurting others by our very physical presence without even knowing that, we, that, that we're carriers, that under those circumstances, certain things on a temporary basis are legitimate. That's been recognized throughout American history when we've had quarantines and cordon sanitaire and various other such things. Um, uh, and it's serious, but it's time limited. One reason to worry about location tracing and such, especially if it's mandatory, not that I'm tremendously worried about it, but I think it's right for people to worry about it, is there the danger is this will last indefinitely. That, that this is going to be seen as a necessary precaution against future plagues, then it might end up being used also, oh, and incidentally, why don't we use location tracking to track people who are members of terrorist groups and then white supremacist groups, and then people who say things on Twitter that some people believe it shows sympathy for white supremacy. These are, these are uh, serious risks, and those are things where indeed the restriction is smaller, but it lasts a much longer time. Whereas here we have something that's a very big restriction, but one that we have every confidence is gonna last for a very short time. And I do think that that's one reason why people are rightly not as, not as troubled by it as they would be had the restriction been, been aimed, uh, similar in magnitude, but aimed at something else and potentially lasting longer and potentially imposed in an egalitarian. Thank and, you. Others? And the so-called smaller restrictions might not be justified at all if they're shown to be ineffective. And I, I think the Eric makes a really good point that he would be happy to see uh, the ACLU's website, which from the beginning has talked about civil liberties being on both sides of the equation here. And if we can have minor restrictions that are effective in getting us safely into uh, a free realm, that that is definitely worth the cost. But unfortunately, oh, some of the proposals have been the worst of both worlds. They, they do restrict our freedom, and they, in fact, don't make us safer in a, a health perspective. I agree with Nadine completely. And I would add one more thing to that. You can put me in the category of the very concerned because I think we're at risk of what I call tyranny by model. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, but the models are not very good, and but yet they can be invoked uh, by, as, as justification for extraordinary restrictions by government. So this is as just another layer to the difficulty of, um, of figuring out as a society when we trust experts and to what extent and so forth. So I am not relaxed about this. Very fine. Thank you. The next question is from Wesley 
P. All I know is the first letter of your last name. Wesley P, please proceed. Hello, everybody. Uh, I just want to say hi. Thank you to all the panelists, especially Professor Strassen. First, I want to say you're a gem. Uh, all, the all the students at New York Law School are fortunate to have you. Yes. So, question. <laughs> Will this pandemic allow for the courts to be more questionable of abuses of executive edicts and even efficient, meaning that there's going to be more technology in the courts? Because we see it in the higher level courts, but on the state courts, even lower um, district courts and other areas are not up to um, speed or technology. Or maybe it's going to be the reverse, and they're going to show more deference to the executives during this time, seeing that making such decisions is too swift. We should wait and let the executive do their jobs for policy. Um, what the other thing I want to say is, uh, and the other thing we didn't mention was employees labeled as essential workers in bad faith. This is mean that we are people who are not nurses and our administrative staff are required to go into office, into work, required to put their safety at risk, essentially under an executive edict that probably should be questioned, but it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wesley. Thank you very much. Let me interject that uh, we have uh, we've arrived at uh, the end of our time. Um, if the panelists are, are willing, I'd like to run over for just five minutes until five. Uh, 20. Uh, so uh, let me ask if there are uh, uh, points that people would like to make in response to Wesley, uh, and then I'll move on to others. In that case, I'm going to ask uh, Eric, uh, did, uh, <clears throat> I hope I get this right, Eric to Jessaro, please. I want to say hi to Wesley and everybody else at New York Law School. Thank you for the greeting. I'm, I, Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. If I could, if I could just very quickly, uh, uh, um, I think uh, there are some second thoughts about Wesley's point. Right. If I could just speak to something that that that, that Wesley uh, uh, mentioned. You know, there one question that arises with all of these things is line drawing. Right? Who is essential and who is not? Some people are very upset at being called essential because they are afraid this exposes them to health risks. Others are very upset at being called non-essential because that dam damages their livelihoods. Uh, there was a Pennsylvania state court case where one of the things that was brought is sort of like a claim, among other things, procedural due process claim, because there were waivers that could be issued by the bureaucracy and the claim, which I think the court had some sympathy for, that there was not really adequate procedures for making sure that this is done fairly. I think this is a very serious issue. It's often an issue of state administrative law. Uh, and uh, uh, at, at the same time, we also have to recognize that's inevitable in any situation, right? Uh, whenever you've, you're trying to draw the line between one thing and another thing, tax exempt things and not tax exempt things, regulated things and not regulated things, you're going to have to uh, draw that line. And it's and it, you can't really do it in the abstract. Often you have to you can come up with a general with a general principle, but then you have to have people making these decisions. And then when there's a claim, it's unfair. We need to know a lot more facts about why it's supposedly unfair. So you can imagine some decisions about essential, non-essential that are clearly right, some that are clearly wrong, and quite a few where, you know, you'd need to know a lot more facts. Very so good. Just for um, a minor point, it, it might make sense to ponder whether it would make, whether it would be useful to designate essential and non-essential in advance, at least to have a little bit more planning um, in order to prepare for the next emergency of this sort. It might not be, right? It might be that, that the facts are, are so specific that, um, that, that we wouldn't get very far with that. But it's certainly something that as, as voters, I think we should contemplate. Good. Eric uh, DiGiusero. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chris, and you're you're very, very close. You get an A, not an A plus, de Jezero. Um, uh, for the panelists, the, the framers of the uh, United States Constitution didn't create the judiciary or even the Bill of Rights to be the ultimate arbiter of safeguarding liberty. They created a system of checks and balances to do so. Unfortunately, over time, the legislative check on executive access at all levels at all levels of government has been largely subordinated to an individual legislator's partisan affiliation, not their institutional uh, affiliation. 
Uh, what do we do about this when the executive is unchecked due to partisan affiliation? Are, are, is the judiciary then the ultimate arbiter and are we doomed as a result? Thank you. Thank you. No, we're not doomed, I would say. I don't think we're doomed at all. I think checks and balances exist, maybe not in as robust a form as you would like, maybe not in as robust a form as I would like, but <clears> the... <throat> But, but what's occurred in the last few months, particularly with some of the state Supreme Court cases I was mentioning, um, where state Supreme Courts do take vigorous action fairly quickly, um, has convinced me that our constitutional structure is in reasonably good shape. Not that it can't be improved, but it's been functioning, I would say, fairly well under enormous stress. I would just add um, that at least at the national level, which is where I've followed these issues, uh, part of the reason for Congress's failure to exercise a robust checking function is because of um, timidity, right? You know, they don't want to have to take responsibility for uh, this is especially salient in the exercise of war making powers, right? They sort of, but on, on many other issues to deny accountability, deniability by, by not weighing in clearly one way or the other. With apologies uh, to the others who are lined up at that microphone in the sky, uh, I'm going to cut things off with one final question, uh, and that will be Bridget Bush. Bridget, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you to the entire panel. This has been a wonderful conference. Um, my question is regarding court proceedings, and um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on to what extent you can change or regulate court procedures to fit the unique challenges of the COVID crisis, and what long-term effects might such remote court proceedings have on litigants' constitutional and due process rights? Thank you. Thank you. One of the most interesting um, developments for Supreme Court watchers is having the court make its oral arguments more readily accessible than has been true in the past. And I haven't been following the extent to which um, the Supreme Court has, has made clear that it's not going to continue to do this after we go back to normal, pre-pandemic normal. But you know, it seems to me that once that bridge has been crossed, that it might be hard to turn back to the old days of uh, just making us wait to hear those oral arguments. Yeah, so uh, I think that's absolutely right. If I can just elaborate on it in two quick ways. One is I think a lot more appellate arguments uh, are, are going to be done by video conference. The Ninth Circuit uh, has uh, uh, has shifted to that, I think, with great success. Some courts, uh, uh, only to audio, uh, such as the Supreme Court, but also some lower courts, for reasons I don't fully grasp, uh, only to audio, that's not a great way of doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, video, I think, it's not perfect. It's not quite as good, quite as effective in some ways, but so much easier, they're not just safer from a health perspective, so much easier and cheaper for everybody, a lot less travel costs. Uh, um, I mean, imagine in the Ninth Circuit, for example, people have to come from Guam to San Francisco. Um, uh, and in fact, I have been told by the Ninth Circuit in the past, they had actually had video conference oral arguments, especially for Guam, as it happens. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think we're also gonna see a lot of that at the trial level. Instead of court call, as we already have at the trial level for telephonic, I think they're going to have more video. And I think a lot of judges are going to say, I like this better. The lawyers like this better. It's cheaper for everybody. Let's do it. And um, it's great, right? Pardon? Environmentalists should like it, too. Right, right, absolutely. A lot less, tra a lot less traffic on the roads, a lot less emissions from the airplane flights and such. Uh, the second question, though, that judges are already facing in courts throughout the country is, how do you do jury trials? which are the chief, chief thing that has to be done in person still. Uh, how do you do jury trials with social distancing? So there's a very interesting document from the District of Nebraska. It's just, it's a report, mostly in outline form, but it has all of these drawings, like a, 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 um, architect style drawings, like blueprints, which show here is a drawing of our courtroom and you'd have four um, jurors sitting in the jury box, 
and then you'd have a juror sitting in where the audience sits, and then and then we're going to have video conference feed to some other courtroom in the courthouse to provide for public access, which is a constitutional mandate. So I think that what's going to happen is that uh, uh, the legal system will adapt to this and will actually learn some things that are good going forward, such as to do more by video conference. Um, the time has come to conclude, and I would like to note that the most important uh, innovation uh, in legal proceedings that we have seen in the past couple of months is that the Federalist Society is now holding uh, such intense and interesting uh, proceedings uh, on Zoom. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Jean, uh, uh, Eugene uh, Meyer and all of his colleagues there uh, for inviting us uh, uh, to this meeting and uh, for this new innovation. I'd like to invite, I'd like to thank all of the many attendees who have joined us and for the many interesting questions uh, that have been raised. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank our distinguished uh, panelists, Nadine Strassen, Eugene Volokh, Julia Mahoney, and Mila Versteeg. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.